Francesco. And uh, I think the time in which we could uh, study fragile state uh, and obtain funding for it relatively easily is coming to an end, I think with the fall of uh, uh, Afghanistan and the kind of shift in policy, we are probably gonna see a big shift in where research money is going to. So this is only to say that this type of research was only possible because I think of a particular moment in history where uh, it was relatively easy to obtain funding for those questions. Um, so this is the um, a paper that uh, expresses kind of the bringing together different disciplines for a question that economics is still in some ways perhaps behind compared to other disciplines. But, but I'm going to try to show that using the tools of economics, we can actually expand um, the knowledge in, in that field. And so this paper is with Gauthier Marché, uh, who is a political anthropologist uh, in England. Uh, Christian Mastaki, who is a former militia member and also one of the leaders of data collection in, in the context in which we work, um, and with David Wu, who is a graduate student in economics at Berkeley. Um, so let me start by showing you the Ryan Mutomboki, who are going to be important for this paper. Ryan Mutomboki is an armed group in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, one of 122 today that are active. Uh, their name stands for Outraged Citizens. Um, and by their name, you may think that they are perhaps just a civil society platform. No, they are one of the most successful and violent armed groups in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, they were formed in large part from the Lega people and Tembo people, who are people from the forest. Um, and part of their success hinges on social mobilization strategies that hinge on very specific mystic or religious beliefs uh, specific to those groups. So in this particular case, you see them wearing uh, protective amulets uh, that everyone in the conflict recognizes as being from the Raya Mutombo. So why am I showing you this? Um, the armed group uh, Raya Mutomboki uh, formed in 2004 at the end of the Second Congolese War. Uh, there was a big peace agreement uh, where most of the warring factions during the Second Congolese War, Congolese War, who controlled territory in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, were integrated into the National Army. Uh, and that created a huge security vacuum in Eastern DRC. The only group that was not part of those negotiations is the Front de Libération de Rwanda, the FDLR, who is a militia that was formed out of the militia who perpetrated the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. And they are known as one of the most brutal armed groups in Eastern DRC that's still present today. So in response to this security vacuum, the FDLR expanded its violence basically across the territory. And so uh, it is in response to the violence and the insecurity generated in this vacuum that a local religious minister, Jean Musumbu, um, <clears throat> mobilized the population to fight against the FDLR. He found a, a particular support by uh, traditional uh, practitioners to fight the FDLR using supernatural protection that was in line with the religious mystical beliefs of the Lega people in the area. And that was the birth of the Raya Mutumboki um, in 2004. They gained wide popular support and in fact they were successful in driving out the FDLR out of Shabunda. Then they stopped, that was for a year or two, and they remained dormant until 2011 when again a security vacuum, this time of a larger scale, uh, created the same dynamic. In particular, there was a policy called the regimentation by the Congolese National Army, who by then was providing security in the area of Shabunda, but uh, the regimentation brought everyone from the army away from Shabunda for uh, streamlining structures of command, but that created a huge security vacuum in Shabunda, and again led to the um, skyrocketing of attacks by the FDLR. Um, so in response, the Ryan Mutomuki re-emerged, took control of most of the district, and they became considerably larger, spread it to district, neighboring districts, and they became what is known as one of the most successful violent social movements in recent Congolese history. So it, it's been compared to a social organization and in some cases uh, to a violent social movement. So why, why is this case important? Because this case crystallizes the two points that I want to make in this talk today. Um, 
The first is has to do with the motivations of people who enter the group or who perpetrate violence, the individuals. The main motivations in this case, based on hundreds of qualitative interviews that we conducted, are not economic motivations. They are rather non-pecuniary motivations related to justice, revenge, uh, in response to attacks that happen in the community, and the desire, or at least they say, to protect their families and, and the community. These motivations are also aligned with the organizational mission of the organization uh, of the Rayan Tombuk, which is about the protection of the communities against the Atila. So the first point is this idea of what motivates people in armed conflict, in this case, uh, perhaps economic motivations may not be enough to understand armed conflict. The second point is that these motivations that I just told you about are those of individuals. But in fact, individuals are not necessarily the relevant unit of analysis when it comes to study who decides whether to enter armed conflict, but rather the community. And so in this specific case of the Raya Mutomboki, the role of village institutions was crucial not just in mobilizing people to join the, the Raya Mutumbuki, but also to coerce people to join the Raya Mutumbuki in response to a collective action problem, which is insecurity. These are just anecdotal uh, conclusions from our interview. So let me show you some examples that are more colorful, perhaps, uh, by people we talked to uh, that were around the Raya Mutumbuki area. The FDLR acted as mercenaries. They became more and more harmful until the population organized themselves given that the army was incapable of stopping the attacks by the FDLR. The Raya Mutomboki emerged in this village in 2011 and was essentially composed of autochtones, of locals, uh, with the objective of chasing away the FDLR. And then uh, we started attacking the FDLR directly um, as the FDLR became violent. So the Raya Mutomboki went away from a defensive mission to an offensive mission and followed the FDLR until they got rid of them. Uh, but it's not just individuals, it's also village institutions that are crucial to understand the success of Raymond Tomboki chapters in different villages. So, for instance, a lot of people told us each village chief went to their village to sensitize the youth to liberation and peace. The young men who identify with that joined the movement voluntarily. They created a committee to enroll the chapters. Each chief organized voluntary contributions by the community. Um, and created a tax for ammunition and food for the Raya Mutumbuki. This is one example of one of those campaigns. Um, the two points that I just made are not specific to the Raya Mutumbuki. They are actually common to most militias in Eastern DRC. And in this case, I'm showing you a recruitment campaign initiated by a village chief. Uh, where they invited a militia called the Nduma Defense of Congo to present the mission of the organization to the village. And if you're in this meeting, the message that you hear is, we are here to protect the village and the territory. The state has forgotten us. Where are the United Nations? We all keep being victimized by the FDLR. Uh, so here is uh, our movement, and you should join if you want. This is how you can join us, and we are open to recruitment, basically. Um, and so that's one of the main mechanisms through which communities uh, mobilized recruitment. The point, as you already see, is that materialistic accounts of armed conflicts are incomplete. That's something uh, obvious to many scholars in other social sciences, but in economics, we still focus on providing individualistic, materialistic accounts of conflict in large part because it's difficult to observe uh, otherwise. And so this is the paper of today. Civil war is important. It has affected a significant share of the world countries. And in economics, we typically consider that this time of armed conflict represents the economic incentives of individuals. Why? In part, because uh, we're inspired by this canonical model of crime of Becker, where an individual can choose whether to enter in the criminal sector for rent or work in the productive sector. And this trade-off is what's going to drive through the opportunity cost or through the incentive to extract rains, whether people enter crime and become violent. However, civil war and armed conflict is not crime, and it's especially not crime by individuals. And there is a huge qualitative literature in, in history and in other social sciences that focuses on these other dimensions. In some cases, those dimensions are central. Sometimes they're not, but they certainly coexist. And the first point that they make is the idea of non-pecuniary motivations, even though we tend to view those motivations in some cases as potentially romanticized. 
or through or expressing motivated reasoning, there's no reason to discard them necessarily as false. And so there's a lot of evidence suggesting that people join because of other motivations than self-interest material. And the second point is, as, as I showed also, is that it's often produced by institutions that govern collective action uh, and not individuals. Now, this gap persists because um, it's difficult to obtain data on Python's motivations, recruitment, institutions, and it's relatively easier, not easy, to observe data on wages and prices that may influence the economic trade-offs or violence. So this is where what we try to do in this paper, and that's the gap that we try to fill. Um, okay, so, so, I think yes. So, uh, I mean, I understand um, that you know motivations may be non-pecuniary, but people still make decisions probably based on uh, benefits and costs. Then the fact that these are not monetary, uh, okay, granted, but. I mean, I, I thought I thought I thought this slide was a bit unfair in a way, in the sense that, mm -hmm. you know, it's like it's not that the economic framework is doesn't cannot account for these things, uh, because when we think about Baker, it's not just monetary benefits and cost; it's also like non-monetary benefits and cost, and those can be incorporated in, in what you call non-pecuniary motivations, right? Yes, one hundred percent. It's not that economics does not have a framework to account for those; it's rather that. What I refer to in this presentation as the prevailing economic framework is Becker with only economic incentives for individuals. That's not that's not fair. Uh, of course, it can uh, indeed incorporate that. And, and the simple model I'll show you is just a simple Roy model where people trade off whether to enter or not. But you also have some components of non-pecuniary motivation that follow different forces. But but it's the same otherwise framework. Yes. Okay. Um, well, that's one noted because it's a little bit of a straw man uh, argument otherwise. Um, so so in in this paper, uh, we uh, examined the relationship between armed groups and society in one of the longest armed conflicts uh, in recent history, the one in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, to answer uh, a wide range and series of questions about this relationship with society. And now the Congo is is a useful context to look at those questions, partly because there's a lot of armed groups that operate today that have operated since 1994. And according to historians, there is an important distinction between different types of armed groups, those that have no connections with society or few connections and that are organized by neighboring countries, and those that are very connected to society, in some cases are the expression of society itself, the militias. So in this setting, these are the three questions that we attempt to answer. The first is, what are these groups' objectives? What's, what is their, uh, and is their violence and recruitment consistent with the prevailing economic framework, by which I mean the pure uh, non-monetary version of Becker? <clears throat> um, uh, the second is, um, now that, as we, you will see, the militia don't particularly fit that framework, um, we ask uh, who are the people who join armed groups and what are their motivations? And we don't, don't just establish that non-pecuniary motivations may be important, but we also attempt to explain how they may come about. Uh, and the, set, the third and last point is, can recruitment really be explained by the trade-offs made by individuals or rather by communities? Uh, and as in the previous point, we try to establish that in some cases it's actually made by the community, but also to explain when the community gets activated to promote participation into violence. So that's what we try to do. There are difficult questions. So the, all the evidence I'm going to show you is going to be suggestive rather than conclusive. It's going to be a body of descriptive evidence with regressions and so on, but I'm not going to show you one well-identified regression on which the paper is about. It's a series of findings that all point in the same direction. Um, the key input into our analysis is a panel on armed groups, villages, and households that we reconstructed dating back to 1990 using investigative techniques, and I'll be more specific about what that is, applied to events that happened in history in 239 villages of Eastern DRC, gathering over a process of first four years, the footprints, quote unquote, left by armed groups in the villages 
Um, the data sets contains two important aspects. First is village level aspects. In these villages, 700 episodes of an armed group chapter. They're called chapter when they are in the village. It's a chapter of an armed group. So 707 episodes of a village chapter of an armed groups with details of uh, about 900 violence operations and recruitment campaigns. And at the individual level, we reconstructed the histories of six to 7,000 individuals obtained in interviews in about 2,000 households. So it's also family members. Um, as well as specifically a subset of those individuals, um, details on the participation in armed groups of 662 ex-combatants or combatants. And as you will see, many of them were still active. Um, so we use this data set to establish three findings. The first is we are able to scrutinize this quote-unquote prevailing economic framework for armed conflict. Um, I want to say for the first time, but I don't know, because we we can look jointly at, at violent events and recruitment. Typically, the, this prevailing economic framework predicts the occurrence of violent events on the basis of changes in the incentives to enter the armed group sector. But we never observe the entry into the armed group sector. So here we're going to look at both at the same time to scrutinize this assumption. Is it really the case that the two are related? There's many reasons why theoretically they may be completely unrelated and certainly not monotonic, which have to do with the industrial organization of violence. Maybe if people join a lot of armed groups, it doesn't necessarily translate there's going to be more violent events, they could be less. Um, and we find uh, that it doesn't really work in this setting, but especially for militias, uh, it's they are whose behavior of violence and recruitment is completely at odds with the predictions of that framework and instead appears to be consistent with uh, a protection, community protection motivation. I'll be more specific about what that means. So the remainder of the paper focuses on militia. This is not to say that the prevailing framework necessarily fails, but uh, it's incomplete for an important armed group, a type of armed groups. In fact, they are important because militias recruit 94% of rural violent labor. They are accountable for 36% of violent events and 50% of village chapter governance episodes. So in the remainder of the paper, we focus on militias to make the two points that I mentioned before. First, who joins those militias and why? If you ask these 662 people, 78% uh, will tell you that they join to protect the family or the community or for revenge. Uh, now, of course, these are self-reported motivations. So there are good reasons to think that maybe themselves, they may romanticize the reasons why they joined, perhaps they feel guilty for having done violence. It's a common concern for this type. So what we do is we write a very simple role model to look at the types of people who join, the sorting into militia away from the productive sector, to ask the question, is the sorting but by reveal preference approach consistent with the self-reported motivations or instead with an economic framework? And we find that it is inconsistent with economic motivations. Um, and we find that it is consistent with uh, the existence of non-economic motivations that are created by exposure, exposure of the individual and separately of the community um, to attacks by these foreign-led armed groups. Okay, and you will see these attacks are generally very gruesome. They have multiple forms of torture as well. Uh, and you see just exactly as the hundreds of qualitative interviews, the people who join are those whose family members have previously been attacked and they want revenge, or that leads them to be motivated to protect the community or the family, or also the people who have not been attacked, but the community has been attacked. And we're going to disentangle these two channels. Now, all of this assumes that it's the individuals who make the trade-off, the decision to join, rather than other units. So the last part of uh, the paper is focused on these recruitment meetings organized, initiated by the village chiefs. And we're gonna show that those skyrocket when there is a security vacuum, consistent with those being a community value of providing protection. And we find evidence suggestive again, that these recruitment campaigns are associated with more voluntary recruitment, but especially are a necessary condition for co coerced recruitment. According to the people who join, there's a large share of people who say, they joined because they were socially forced to join, and the recruitment campaigns initiated by the chief seems to be associated with that. 
Um, so that's the paper in a nutshell. The, the main contribution we think is perhaps the notion that violent conflict is produced by society, not by isolated individuals. And that triggers these other dynamics that connect the individual to society, whether it is preferences that internal, internalize the uh, internalize the externalities of fighting or internalize the well-being of society, like non-pecuniary motivations, or uh, also when those are insufficient, the role of coercion by institutions. Um, and we find that militias, especially, are better described as collective action by rural political institutions, fueled by revenge and solidarity in a time and place in Eastern DRC at the time, with huge demand to fight the perpetrators of anti-social violence, the foreign-led armed groups. Most of the time, it's going to be the FDLR, this foreign-led armed group, but very often it's going to be groups organized by Rwanda as well, the RCD, among other groups who are also very violent. So there's three literatures that this relates to. The first that I've alluded to many times is in economics, there's been a growing interest in the study of conflict that focuses on these uh, individual economic trade-offs, but um, there is a very large literature in other social sciences focusing on non-economic aspects in the individual trade-off, as well as non-individualistic forces, the community. But by doing that, uh, we actually also relate to the literature of protest and political participation, who are already familiar with those forces, but actually uh, we, we relate to it by showing that the same forces extend to armed conflict and civil war, and we document the existence of fundamental community-oriented motivations to microfound the effect of war and conflict on, on participation into future protests, which is vital in this case. And so, of course, because we talk about fundamental preferences or intrinsic preferences, there's a connection with intrinsic motivation literature. In general, empirically, not theoretically, uh, scholars have focused on intrinsic motivation or non-pecuniary motivations that exist and try to answer questions of who selects into the public sector or into organizations that have a socially oriented nation. So the contribution here perhaps is to try to provide at least suggestive evidence of how these motivations may form in the first place through traumatic events in, in the history of an individual. So that's what we do and where we think we are located. Let me give you a one slide brief history of armed groups in the RC. I've talked already a lot about the context with the Raya Mutomboki. But in the background, yes. Have you are you gonna say something about the these kind of militia leaders that do the recruiting effort? Like so are you gonna be focused in saying you know why they do this and so on? You, you seem to talk about the people that join the militia, but I was wondering, are the are the leaders as well motivated by this sort of these non pecuniary motives or or not? Like I was wondering whether you're gonna say something about that or not. Um, in this paper, no, because of the lack of data. Uh, we do have one variable that we have not yet exploited, which is which level in the group the individual took part of. And perhaps we may be able to document that the motivations at different levels uh, vary. I don't know if over time, but, but at least vary. Um, in another project, we're actually working with one of the largest armed groups uh, at the moment with 120 HR commanders in the group to uh, identify not just uh, who joins in real time and follow them, but also what are the logic of these HR commanders. Um, one thing that we seem to find for now in the preparatory phase of that project is that at the top of the organization, people are very pragmatic and have a more cynical approach to those motivations. They use those motivations as a tool to maximize recruitment. They do these campaigns, propaganda, mission statement campaigns to mobilize the resentment in people uh, in order to fill the ranks. Similarly, for these supernatural protection devices, most of the fighters deeply believe in it, but the leaders sometimes you see them smile a little bit. It's almost like a technology of governance. In this paper, we can't say anything about that, unfortunately. It's all about fighters and community. Okay. But perhaps it's it's also valuable in what you say to 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 perhaps tone down the idea of non-pecuniary motivations as explaining these organizations rather than the individual decision to join, which is different. 
yeah, it was more to think about whether, you know, these leaders are leveraging these non pecuniary motivations uh, to their own advantage somehow, while they're at the same time, they are instead like pecuniary motivated. You know, I, I was just thinking about it in this way. Yes. Um, that would be beyond the scope of this paper, but um, but it would be interesting to think about whether or not the leaders are motivated with these non-pecuniary motivations, how that interacts with the instrumentalization of those motivations for rec recruitment. Um, it's a, it, it, in that case, it would be even more supporting of your story in the sense that if they find profitable, quote unquote, to frame things in this way, instead of saying, to people, I'm going to pay you. They say, you know, this is to protect your village, your family, and so on. If they, if at equilibrium, they choose this way of incentivizing people rather than money, this will be even a stronger argument in favor of of, of the strength of these non non pecuniary motivations. You see what I mean? Like, yes. Um, one thing that we find in this other project is we we have data on the recruitment campaigns of these own groups. And the campaigns is just where they spend eight hours telling the mission of the organization. And you see this effect where using diff and diff or across different villages where those campaigns take place, you see a, an increase that lasts for a few days after the campaign or a few weeks in the number of people who join, even though the campaigns are just providing a message. Um, the leads are very conscious of the importance of that, but yeah, it remains to be shown. Uh, one could think of those campaigns actually saying how much money you can make in the group and comparing uh, the recruitment effect. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so, so the Congolese conflict starts in 94, 96 uh, with the first and second Congolese wars where foreign led armed groups, mostly organized by Rwanda, Burundi and also Uganda set bases in Eastern DRC and for a variety of reasons begin to perpetrate gruesome violence against the rural Congolese since the beginning. Um, now, based on testimonies, talking of, with hundreds of people there, uh, it appears that foreign rebel violence uh, might have motivated many Congolese people in rural areas to support, to mobilize and to enroll in these subsequently formed organizations, the militia. The militia are uh, originally formed during the wars as part of a large-scale armed resistance movement. The predominant form of the Congolese militia is called the Mai Mai. Mai Mai, any organization can be a Mai Mai as long as they are a grassroots violent organization that uses some supernatural form of protection. Um, and so they typically have a very strong rural basis. Almost all of them emerged in one village or a group of villages and then began to expand. Um, so it's part of uh, life for many. Um, so having said this, uh, this is what the paper will be about. I'll talk a little bit about the data collection, and then I will uh, uh, follow the three points that I mentioned, scrutinize the economic framework, and talk about who joins and the role of village institutions. So the core sample, yes. Hi, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just have a quick question. I'm a historian, so bear with me, because so that background is what's really pulling me in. I'm a, actually a historian who works on a, a DRC, particularly between 1960 and 1990. And uh, one quick thing I wanted to bring up in your background is that particularly among Lega communities, um, they had dating back to the 1960s in the revolts um, that took place um, uh, Lega communities actually formed um, armed militias to fight off the rebels in the 60s. And I'm wondering if that ever came up in groups that had Lega members. Like, I, there is some literature on this um, uh, it, from the period, um, uh, from, the, from the mid to late 60s. And I have a colleague in, Bel uh, in Belgium, uh, Gillian Matisse, who's actually trying to reconstruct like oral histories of people who fought on, on the side of the rebels. But the Lega had a really strong reputation for actually fighting off the rebels um, in the past. And I'm wondering if that had if that ever came up in discussions about why the, why Lega members, at least of Lega communities, joined up in um, into these uh, militias um, in later decades. Thank you so much. That's fascinating. So I have uh, part of the answer is yes for a group very closely connected to the Lega, it's the Nyanga. 
Um, and so I worked a lot with, with the Nyanga that's just north of, of Shabunda in Walikale, and, and they were historically marginalized by the colonial administration with those groups to the west of Bukavu with uh, Lega and so on. So they, they have some similar features as well. They're people from the forest and, and they are kind of a coordinated, decentralized state or, or autonomous uh, units that, that look a lot like, like the Lega, the decentralization. They're different. But for them, whenever you talk about mobilizing into the Nduma defense of Congo, they remember uh, the Sheru Bari movement in 1906. That was one of the predecessors. And then they remember the Kitawala movement in the 40s that, in fact, originated in Brooklyn, came through South Africa, then through Katanga. and was one of the leading motivations for these people because there is the myth that there was this Sherubari leader that was imprisoned and then disappeared and was never found. And so there's always been among them. Uh, and, and it was just a reemergence of that. Uh, for the Lega people, I never heard uh, those narratives. I never asked. Um, I could follow up with your question with my colleague Gautier, who is the ethnographer in the group and has conducted a lot more uh, interviews on the Raya Mutombo. Um, and for the 60s, you they were fighting the Simba, or were these the rebels? At least, at least the Lega were. Um, I know that because for my own project, and one of the, the things that came up was I interviewed a former North American, US and Canadian Mennonite uh, Central Committee volunteers, and a number of them were um, assigned to a mission in Kama, um, which is kind of it, it, maybe a few hours drive, at least in the old days when the roads were good, uh, from Kindu. And uh, they were there from about 66 till 74. And a lot of the people who were there, the Lega, pe Lega people were there, would talk about how they fought off uh, they fought off the Simba who came in. The Simba were seen as foreigners. Some of them, there were also kind of memories of the of, of the late 19th century slave trade that came up because uh, most of the rebels were Tatatela, were Tatela and were associated with um, basically Muslim slave raiders um, in the period. Um, but, and that, and that there is, there is again, I mean, I can't speak for the Nyanga, but for at least for Lega, those, at least from the standpoint of the of the former aid workers that I spoke with, that seemed to be a, a central issue was that Lega people were identifying themselves as, as forming into armed groups to fight off um, to fight off what they saw as foreign invaders. I mean, in some ways, it's kind of a precursor to what you're dealing with from the 1990s onward. It's sort of, I think there's sort of a longer, just a longer genealogy of local communities forming armed groups. But I, I won't take any more time yeah. here. So. Oh, uh, yes, yes, I thank you so much for the comment. I'll, I, will, I will follow up after the presentation as well, because there is a persistence even within the time window in which we speak of initial movements that then motivate the subsequent mobilization. Um, uh, okay, so, so um, for the data, the core sample of the study is the dedicated data collection in South Kivu that uh, is done, was done in 2013 in 1,000 households of 133 villages, where we record, reconstructed the history of violence, armed group presence, and relationship to the village and respondent membership. Um, this data was collected by uh, two researchers in each of the villages, overall 10 researchers, where uh, in, during one week of work in each village, they reconstructed the village history through qualitative interviews. So they have very strict guidelines of how they had been trained by a, a qualitative researcher to conduct this, this type of report. So we have these long qualitative reports for each village. And they quantitatively reported at the end of the week the history of the village for a subset of variables, as well as they conducted household interviews in eight households where they spoke with a randomly selected person for an entire day, um, uh, the interviews so with breaks and so on to reconstruct the history of the household, but also taking advantage of the conversation with the household to learn about the history of the village. So it allows to triangulate a lot of information. So the pr procedure more specifically was a day long meeting with village elders, where the village uh, elders, quote unquote, is history specialists of the village, whoever was uh, appeared to be most knowledgeable, was trained at the beginning of the week to reconstruct the village history for the whole week. And so every week they would be, every day they would be monitored or retrained um, 
and the household survey where we extracted or obtained information about participation in armed groups and violent attacks, occupational choice, migration, assets, and history of the village. About five pages qualitative reports about focus on the militia in the village for each village. And then finally, at the end of the week, the researchers go back with the history specialists and spend an entire day um, reconstructing the final deficit of the village, but also uh, it allowed them to detect and correct reporting errors. In our experience in the pilot, you know, there were very few informations that we that appear to be sensitive for the village history specialist, things like there is a tax collected in the village mill, and that's something that they don't want to reveal, but the households are really upset about. So that's the procedure that we followed to kind of uh, identify the traces left back. Of course, it took many months to determine what we could recover and what was impossible to recover. Um, and that allows to cross-validate the data. Here's an example from the pilot of a data set of, of an example of the forms that are completed during an entire week. Variables like this are gonna be less reliable and we knew, but then we were able to reconstruct questions like uh, when did you acquire a goat? So it was easy for people to remember. Of course, they may not remember the exact year at which they acquired a goat or certain things happened. So there's a number of strategies in the survey designed to reduce the error of reporting due to recall of years. So regional, we, we develop time queues that are regionally known for everyone by the province. So when Mobutu uh, ended and things like that, people remember very well if they got married after or before Mobutu, even they may not remember the exact year. Within the household survey, we also create self-generated time queues where we start with the important life events of a person and then anchor all the remaining questions to those life events as time queues. And then we also conducted some working memory tests that we use in some places to weight the observations, uh, downweight observations for people who appear to have bad working memory. This is the list of militias that appear in our data set, and I can be more specific later about how we classify those, but the classification is number one, uh, unambiguous, except for one group that is marginal, uh, called the local defense, whether it's a popular militia or a foreign-led armed group. Here it says foreign, but it's really foreign-led. Uh, and second, all of our results are not dependent on how we classify. They're driven by whether the uh, armed group chapter was formed in the village, which is a subset of popular militia anyways. Uh, but that's basically the type of data that, that we obtain. Um, there's, of course, two big challenges in everything that I'm going to say. We have to believe the data on participation in armed groups, and it's a high bar for this data to be credible. So uh, what is participation? Concretely, it's the active involvement in the security-related activities, so it's fighters. Uh, we look at whether you join and also whether you are participating. So episodes can be of three years. You just join at the beginning. It does not include other roles like informants. Uh, the challenges are, of course, reporting bias. People may not want to tell us. And in some cases, we found that some people were reticent to tell us. We know which places. In, it's in Mwenga. There were, uh, it wasn't uh, an environment comfortable to talk about this. Uh, and there may be survivor bias. Perhaps the people who tell us today that they joined are only those who survived, and those who survived in armed groups may be different than those who survived outside of armed groups. So we designed some strategies to mit mitigate those challenges. In particular, we also obtain at the village level for every year, for every village chapter of an armed group, how many people joined in the village, this uh, chapter. And so when we compare uh, the data that we obtain using the village aggregate anonymous report, this has the advantage that one, it's anonymous, um, and, and two, it's at the village level. So no matter if these people still exist or not, we will recover them. So we estimate using the sample in South Kivu, uh, because that's what I'm talking about now, that on average, a village between 95 and 2013, one village produces 55 recruits in the period. When we use the household survey individual reports, just the raw data, the same calculation using the number of households and the sampling procedure gives us 53.4. So as expected, it's a bit less, but it's extremely close. Um, and of course, the people who are here today telling us some of them may not come from the village. Uh, so we may want to exclude those who don't come from the village. In the next one, we exclude those who are migrants, those who are here today, but maybe they came five years ago. 
Uh, and we find, again, a very similar number. This is by construction an underestimate because it does not include the people who have left the village or who have died. Uh, but necessarily, in any case, the truth lies somewhere between these two lines. Uh, and finally, um, all of these data restricts to people who join during an episode of an armed group chapter in the village, which is how we collected this data. But if we also allow the household survey to tell us about any episode of joining an armed group, no matter whether it was during a village chapter, we get again a very similar number. This is by construction a larger set because it's larger than the set of recruitment episodes here, but the data sets are surprisingly similar and I'll be more specific about why this is the case. That's for militia. For foreign armed group, it's more complicated. Why? Because it's more taboo to tell that you have joined a foreign armed group in the community. Uh, and so we were able perhaps to say, to identify that on aggregate certain people came, but when you ask them, it was harder for them to tell you that they had participated in our armed group. The other reason, potentially, is that militia participation is a fundamentally local phenomenon. Many people are active while they live in the village and they return to their communities. It's not like participating in an anti-social group, like foreign-led armed groups, where it may be harder to reintegrate. So the second reason for this bias here could be that a selection bias. And that's the reason why in the remainder of the paper, we're going to be focusing all of the effort on understanding the militia for whom we know that the data is more reliable. So, so why is it positive? I just mentioned it's commonplace. Um, in many areas, we obtained the authorization from the prevailing militia to collect data. It was not taboo. These are areas where the central state is not present. There was one area in southern Wenga where the qualitative reports revealed that people were not very comfortable talking even about participation in one Mai Mai episode. But in general, it appears to be quite successful. The other reasons that we find in the data is the mean duration of a participation episode is short, uh, 2.68 years. And uh, almost half of the people who are combatants in our sample were active during the interview. Yeah. They were actually Raya Mutomboki fighters. We obtained the authorization by the Raya Mutomboki leadership to go in. And they were very happily telling us that my Kalashnikov is under the bed. Whenever they want, I just go to the to the every evening or so the second question is the quality of measurement of attacks. I'll be a bit faster here, uh, but an attack is any violent operation that takes place in the village, typically by armed organization. Similar challenges, people may forget or people may not want to tell us the truth that they were attacked. Um, so there's a number of strategies to mitigate those challenges. First, again, we reconstruct the history of attacks through history specialists in the village. And we also gather the same information about the attacks in the village from households. So when you compare the number of attack years episodes in which a household tells us that they have been attacked, um, um, and you compare to the reports of other households, it is relatively close. The report of the village survey, it's less. Uh, and that's in part because people in the household may be attacked outside of the village. And so perhaps there's a correction here to be made, but in any case, it's not too far. And when you compare to either other households or the village chief, the number of attacks reported is relatively similar, no matter what's the origin of the attack. Um, so there's additional data sources that I've mentioned in passing. They're incomplete. Each Actually, of the additional, yeah. Uh, both in uh, when looking at attacks and also I think when looking at recruits, there seem to be some more uh, some less consistency for information on foreign groups, right? Yes. So uh, do you have any sense of why that may be the case or? Foreign group uh, participation, yes. It is more taboo to participate in a foreign group. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Uh, but for, for the attacks, I'm, I'm, I'm not very sure, uh, to be honest. So, that's something to think about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the comment. Um, so there's three other sources that we sometimes use whenever it's possible. All of the results replicate whenever the data exists. So in the district of Shabunda, we oversample households for which we obtain very basic past participation information. We don't have their history. In the province of North Kivu, we also did um, 106 villages. Uh, the focus was on a different project, but we were able to include participation information on household respondents and household members. That is, is uh, the history is much weaker and the motivation for joining is absent. Uh, 
And then in another data collection in North Kivu, we survey 10 additional households in these villages to, to ask also other information, but we were able to include participation information to verify some of the conclusions. So um, take it together, this sample is the sample that I started with. Uh, even though the focus on participation, I will always focus on South Kivu for consistency. And whenever a table has data from somewhere else, I, I will show you that it replicates. So these are um, the villages where at least one household reports of the sample of eight households reports that they have previously been attacked uh, in North and South Kivu. And this is where uh, at least one household of the eight houses in each village reports that they have participated in the past. Um, so, so first part, how powerful are economic explanations? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say standard empirical framework for testing the prevailing economic framework which is generally using price shocks for commodities that uh, people can use violence to extract, to steal. So generally the way people uh, go about testing the economic framework is to say, well, if the price for a commodity goes up and that commodity is easy to, to steal and maybe doesn't require a lot of, um, um, doesn't um, require a lot of labor to produce, then you may be incentivized to go into the violent sector to appropriate that resource. Um, and, and if the price of uh, goes down, then maybe you may uh, be tempted to remain in the production in the production sector. So here this setting has two already studied price shocks for commodities. One of them is the price of content that goes up by a lot in the year 2000 for reasons that are uh, orthogonal to the Congolese context that have to do with PlayStation and the price of gold, which also goes up by a lot in the period. It's a different price at a different time. But these two minerals are allocated differently in different villages in the area. So one can run the typical regression in this context, which is whether there is a violent event in village J in year T, uh, given that um, regressing that on village fixed effects, year fixed effect, and then um, an interaction between whether the village J has a given mineral M and the price of mineral M. And so if uh, mineral M is one that can easily be appropriated, the rise in the price of mineral M should lead to more violence according to the framework and therefore gamma should be positive. The assumption behind the framework is that it leads to more violence because it leads to more people to be recruited in the violent sector. That has never been tested. So that's what we first examined in the first part of the paper. Uh, coltan and gold, these are the two uh, explanatory variables. When you test the main prediction, coltan goes up, that increases the number of the occurrence of violent events by a lot. Uh, so that's consistent with the existing framework. Uh, for the price of gold, nothing happens. So this effect is actually coming only exclusively by uh, foreign armed groups violence. Uh, attacks by militia do not respond to the coltan shock neither do they respond to the gold shock. Um, uh, so it seems the first conclusion is that at least for militia, the violent events do not seem to be correlated with changes in the economic trade-offs as much as they do for foreign armed groups. The second finding here is that when you look at recruitment, which is the channel assumed in the prevailing economic framework, the rise in violence by foreign armed groups is not matched by a rise in recruitment into foreign armed groups. But there is a rise in recruitment during those years, and it's into militia, precisely those that are not violent here. And I have. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, um, so these patterns appear inconsistent with the economic framework, partly because it doesn't work for militia, and two, recruitment and violence are at odds. This is just suggestive. But it's also suggested that the recruitment into militia appears to be related to the rise in violence by foreign armed groups. And perhaps so, it's more related oh, to the need to do something that. about uh, That's not what the table is necessarily implying, but it's consistent with. When you look locally oh, can I ask um, you at uh, whether when you decompose the Coltan uh, price shock into whether um, um, there is higher recruitment by either organization, you don't see that the increase in violent events is driven by places that have more recruitment, which is what should be predicted by the framework. It's all driven by the other places. Um, 
and so and that's that's for reporting on group C. So that's kind of the second uh, the second implication a bit more elicited, which is the relationship between economic incentives and violence does not seem mediated by recruitment, which is the core assumption of the framework. And and militias don't fit any of these relationships, yet militias are important. When you take the total uh, sample of North and South Hugo, and you look at the number of uh, recruits that are generated in the time period between 95 and 2013 in a, in a village, militia produce 32.3 on average. For South Kivu, it's 55 because there's much more militia activity. But in, in the whole sample study too, against foreign led armed groups and Congolese army. Of course, we saw that there is a bias in the reporting of individuals of foreign led armed group participation, but the scale of the bias is unable to explain this magnitude of this match. Militias do recruit much more rural violent labor. And so when it comes to understand conflict, which has to do with recruitment into conflict, militias are important. Militias are important also in terms of violent operations. Here's the number of violent operations uh, perpetrated by different armed groups. Militia are accountable for 274, foreign armed groups for about 500. This accounts for 36% of all violent events. Um, and um, and their, their, their attacks are also important in terms of how gruesome they are. You tend to see also militias to be less uh, predatory than foreign armed groups, as you would expect if they are more representative of the popular uh, demands. And in terms of governance, militias are also very important. They represent almost 50% of the village chapter episodes in North and South Kivu. Um, uh, just like other groups, they need to collect taxes to survive. They are important in governance episodes, they're important in violent episodes. Um, and one fundamental distinction is that the militias have much more support by uh, the community. So there is less opposition against the militia, um, and that's driven by the militia form in the village. The parents encourage the participation into the militia, especially if they are formed in the village, or the youth um, uh, are encouraged by the chief. In many cases, the chief is in fact a relative of the chapter's leader. Um, and foreign armed groups need to force the chief to participate into the chapter. So the, to conclude, the point I wanted to make here is that militias are important, uh, an important part of the conflict, and they seem to be different in that they have more popular support. Um, if Raul? Oh, okay. I I don't have sound. Uh, let now I should hear you. Can you? Yes. Yeah. Sorry for that. No, I, uh, I was just wondering for the for the regression results that you showed on the the price regressions that you were showing before, the one before, the main one. I was wondering whether the so first whether the non significance on the gold uh, can be driven by the fact that the, there needs to be more of a looks like more of a linear trend rather than a, a shock as we see for for Coltrane. So I was wondering whether that's why you don't you can't identify anything off it. And the second thing is. I've always been like puzzled by this kind of specification in the sense that what you see is, is equilibrium violence, right? And so if, this, if these prices are changing both the supply and the demand, then you can very well have a zero effect on, on violence. I think you were hinting to this at some point earlier on in the talk. So I was wondering, and you know, the fact that you don't find, for instance, uh, in column three, you find zero there, but then in, in, in point six, you find a, a so you find an effect on recruiting, but not an equilibrium balance. I was wondering whether there is any supply demand versus supply shift story that can can put these facts together. I don't know if you thought about it in that way. Uh, could you be specific about demand and supply of what of labor? Yeah, so I, I'm thinking, you know, if if the price of coltan goes up, it's true mm -hmm. that uh, the the supply of conflict should go up because people won't have more to appropriate. But it could be also that the demand for conflict goes up in the sense that people uh, are richer, for instance, and so the opportunity cost goes down and all these things. So I, you know, I would it would be nice if if I don't know if you did that, but if we go one by one through this story, because I see column four to six more related to the to the supply of conflict, right? So that's recruitment. 
while column one to three is more about the equilibrium level. So there is supply, uh, there is demand also into that. So I was wondering if, if some of these facts could be squared thinking about it in that framework. I don't, yes. I, I don't have anything on top of my head now, but something along these lines whether it can be done. So two things. Uh, first, the point of this table is only to show that this simple explanation doesn't match the data. It could be because there's all those responses that exist at the same time. Okay. Um, this may be consistent with the framework. It depends whether you think that one is labor intensive or not. But the point yes. is to establish like, oh, here is one that uh, has this violent response. It is not matched by recruitment. So just for whatever is the reason, it does not fit. Second, uh, later in the paper, we take advantage of the gold shock. It appears that the gold shock uh, is a very good example of a labor intensive commodity, uh, where depending of when we look at the individual level data, you see that this becomes statistically significant. So there is a the gold shock deters people from entering the violent sector, which is consistent with this uh, opportunity cost channel. And the point here is like we we don't need to take a stance. So, okay, if there is a commodity that increases violence, then that fits the appropriation channel, but it's not matched by recruitment. There could be a labor supply story. Here we're going to provide another alternative story, but this table does not prove uh, this alternative story. Okay, but so if I look at column six and I see these positive effects on on recruitment into militia, you you like I thought a point you wanted to make is that these economic explanations don't bite but if i look at that coefficient why should i conclude that that's not the case no the this is not about so the reason economic explanations don't bite is twofold the first is if there are economic reasons in this very simple framework for the price of coltan to incentivize violence why doesn't it work for militia so maybe they bite for foreign armed groups but then why don't they work for militia? The rest of the paper is about militia. The second is, um, even if they work for foreign armed groups, they seem to be at odds uh, with recruitment and here as well. So there can be very well an economic explanation for why the rise in the price of Coltan increases recruitment into militia, but these don't map into violent events, which is what the current framework predicts. So the only point is to show that there are these inconsistencies in recruitment and violent events. Okay. But the table does not, yeah. But here I read these results as an increase in the price of Colton increases attacks by foreign groups, which triggers recruitment into militia. And therefore indirectly, the price of Colton drives the recruitment into the militia. So there is this economic motivation. And the economic yes. motivation is the maybe the protection of this Colton, because you said at the beginning, it's protection of the family, the community, but maybe it's protection of the Colton. Yes. Uh, that's there is the economic motivation, maybe. Yes, that's consistent with that. But the one that's failing is this one. So first, the recruitment and violent events do not match as you would expect. Neither with militia, even though this rise could be explained by economic motives, you don't see a rise in violent events by militia either, even though it could be purely the uh, indirect expression of the economic sense. But um, all I gather is that this is too much of a strawman uh, to, to deconstruct. And the point of the paper is not about this. So I'll, I'll, I'll go faster to what the point is. So. So what are militias maximizing? We don't know, but look at, these are five episodes of um, insecurity in the recent history of the Congo that appear in the data. The first is the first Congo war, the second Congo war beginning, the cold and shock, um, the Sun City peace agreement that generated the security vacuum and the regimentation. Those are associated with spikes in violence or decreases in the presence of state forces. Um, so they are all associated with a, a kind of a spike of the insecurity in them. And it's precisely in those years where you see recrudescence of militia recruitment, um, exactly in those years when there is more activity, violent activity by foreign armed groups or less protection against that activity. This, this one is a very good example of what Francesco and Mathieu were saying. 
uh, militias are recruiting. They're not perpetrating violent events, but this could be an indirect reflection of the economic motives because violent groups come to attack those communities, leading to the mobilization to protect. But that is the second step that this paper is going to be focused on, which is the mobilization to protect. Um, so, so who are the people who join the militia and what motivates them? Um, so here is when you just take the self reports. Um, about 11% of people who join the militia say that they were motivated by economic incentives, whether it's money or status. About 70%, 76% say that they had motivations to protect the community or the family or for revenge, which we call non-pecuniary motivations, whether they're pro-social or anti-social, they're non-pecuniary. And 13% say that they were motivated by coercion. Uh, coercion in all the reports is social coercion by people in the community or their chiefs. So let me focus on these two uh, first voluntary types of motivation, and especially this one, uh, because people might have incentives to misreport their true motivations. So um, they may be subject to motivated reasoning. So what we do is we set up a very simple ROI model to analyze the type of people who join and see whether sorting into the militia is consistent with those motivations. So suppose that the utility of not joining is composed of a stable wage in the productive sector and an idiosyncratic uh, productivity, productive capacity component in the productive sector. And individuals choose whether to remain in the productive sector or to enter um, the armed group, the militia sector. The militia payoffs are composed of perhaps some material rewards inside the militia, even though all the qualitative evidence we have suggests that material rewards are fairly limited, they may exist for some of the largest militia. Um, they may have an idiosyncratic uh, reward of joining the militia, which could be, we call this, for now, let's call this idiosyncratic motivation component. Uh, later, we can talk whether this could be economic. And then there are two important components here that are going to be important in this setting. The first is um, um, this one. It is composed with A. A is a random variable, which is the degree to which the individual is ex previously exposed to attacks by foreign led armed groups. And so if um, in individuals have, if foreign led armed groups causes motivations to join militia, then H, which is a parameter, should be larger than zero. And so more attacked individuals should have more payoff for joining militias. But we also allow for the fact that perhaps people are motivated not by their own individual experience to violence in their family, but that in the community. So A bar is kind of the average level of violence in the community. And perhaps different people are differently sensitive to attacks in the community. That may also be the case. So, so economic incentives are W and e epsilon zero, and the rest are the non-pecuniary motivations in this simple framework. And this is going to be important because the correlations between these variables is what's going to be the driving force in the predictions. So one can simply show in this framework that if the motive for joining are strictly economic, meaning in the extreme case that this is zero, um, then individuals who join should have lower mean productive capacity um, than those who do not join. Mean productive capacity in the production sector. And joining should be associated with a larger present discounted value of income than non-joining. In this framework, it's static, so it's just associated to larger income. The same individual, if we were able to observe the individual in the group, they would have more income than outside. Um, and the second prediction is that if we find that it's not true, as we will find in the data, if those who join have higher, not lower productive capacity, meaning that their idiosyncratic productivity shock is larger than zero, then the following will be true. Um, basically, this relationship will be composed of either those who have higher productive capacity also have, for some correlation, idiosyncratic motivation to join militias. So people who have more assets for some reasons, perhaps it's uh, the type of education, are more motivated to join militias. Or, um, the people who have higher productive capacity are more sensitive to attacks on the community, to the level of attacks. Then you would, these would lead this pattern of sorting. Or people who have more productive capacities are also more often targeted by attacks. 
and attacks generate this motivation. So if we observe this positive sorting into the militia, this relationship should hold. And we're going to look one by one at these relationships. Um, and finally, if we find evidence that indeed foreign led armed groups attack target the richest households, then for this term to be driving the sorting, it has to be that household victimization increases the probability to join or increases the intrinsic motivation to join. And, and one can show that this obviously leads to a higher mass of people joining. So we're going to test for each of those predictions in this part of the paper. Uh, when you look at people who join militia, no matter where the militia are formed, in terms of democratic characteristics, compared to the same people in the same village, to the people in the same village in the same okay. year. Can I interrupt you? Yes. I'm trying to think whether some of, whether the ROI setup can also have reconciled those uh, results on, uh, on the prices. Uh, yeah. Because I was thinking, you know, basically, if the prices determine basically the threshold for, for sorting, no? if the prices determine the, the W or the M, right? So, you, or you can think about them as determine the W, no? So that's as, as, that, as those change, as the W, for instance, changes, you're gonna have the, the identity of the marginal individual that's gonna be recruited into, into the militia is gonna, be, is gonna be different, right? Mm -hmm. so in particular, if there is positive sorting, which I guess is what you find given what we're saying, the marginal, uh, the, the, the last one who's, who's recruited is going to be of lower quality than the ones that were already in the militia, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that could be a reason why you, despite recruiting goes up, you see no effect on, on, on equilibrium violence because these guys are relatively bad hiders, you know, something like that. Yeah, I, yeah I no. Uh... I think it would be important for you to think about the implications that this ROI setup would have in that for the results in those regressions, because there may be some relationship. Yeah, although heterogeneity in the type of, in the productive capacity of individuals is gonna have no relationship in the extent to which the militia is able to perpetrate violence. It's not like it's a high skill activity, but but I'll leave that on the side so I can focus on the proposed explanation. I think it's it's useful. And and again, we, I, we get stuck with this Truman theory and, and maybe we have to tone down in this paper. But the point is those who join um, tend to have more productive capacity in the nonviolent sector uh, on average. So um, they tend, the, their father tend to have a higher wealth index than people in the same village in the same year at the time they joined or a chiefdom or territory district. They tend to have uh, a large number of plots. They tend to have higher working memory score in the exams um, that we do in the, in the survey. So there seems to be positive sorting on productive capacity. Um, this is not identified, but you see that people who join do not have a larger increase in future assets than people who do not join. Uh, if at all, you see a lower increase, and that's, that would be also inconsistent. Um, of course, there's all sorts of sorting going on, but, but you don't see striking evidence that their, um, their assets are going up. So when you look at the three components that I mentioned before, the only component that appears to be driving the result is that why are richer people, more productive capacity people, more likely to join armed groups? Uh, well, one explanation is that foreign-led armed groups violence disproportionately target richer people. Um, and we do an extra analysis to explain this, but basically it's all driven by pillaging operations. Foreign-led armed groups know who is the rich, who are the rich people in the village. They generally have local spies. And so they target people who have more assets. And that's why people who have more assets tend to have more exposure to foreign-led armed group attacks. Now, if those attacks cause motivations to join militia, then this could be an explanation for this positive pattern of sorting. And that's going to be the next step. When we look at the remaining uh, components of this relationship, that is basically no effect. I'll spare you the details, but that basically compares different subsamples of the sample that vary in the extent to which they have been attacked in the community or in the household. And there is no relationship between productive capacity and those and as, as would be predicted. So it appears that perhaps it's driven by, um, by the fact that attacks target the most uh, productive capacity individuals and that then they develop a motivation to join. But for this to be an explanation, we need to show that age 
is indeed larger than zero, that attacks cause motivations. So that's what we do. Um, we basically exploit variation in foreign led armed group violence at the household level across individuals, villages, and years in the whole period, including individual village year effects, because people can be moving across those villages, year effects, age effects, so for cohort, and look at uh, conduct a simple uh, event study using the state of the art um, uh, estimators, in this case, for Sayak et al. And what we find is that uh, the, if the effect of the household being victim of a foreign learn group attack is positive. It's significant perhaps after two years, then it remains positive. Um, and uh, you see this massive spike after. This is an artifact of the fact that the biggest share of recruitment uh, is into the Raya Mutomboki in starting in 2011, and that in the preceding years, there's very little violence. It's actually uh, most of the violent attacks are during the Congo wars. And so that's why you see this jump after here. But in general, what you see is that if a household is attacked, the subsequent probability that the respondent in that household becomes a militia member is uh, increases. Now, the problem with this regression, one of the many problems, is that if the household is attacked, then the village has been attacked. There's been an uh, operation in the village, almost surely. Uh, therefore, it's impossible to tell from this regression whether the reason why people join is because age is larger than zero, they have an individual response to being attacked, or the community has been attacked, and that's what motivates them. So we separate this into, uh, we put this in a simple diff and diff framework, but basically we first look at, take a step back and ask whether the village has been attacked. And since there's many attacks, we just look at the cumulative number of attacks in the village. We find that the cumulative number of attacks that take place in the village, that includes household and, and community motivations, has a positive effect on whether someone joins. This is preserved if we use all of these extra samples. And uh, it's driven in terms of magnitude, not significance, it's driven by motivations to protect the community, which is 0.49, or revenge. There's, of course, a significant effect here uh, of money, perhaps because those who have been attacked are also uh, have less assets uh, in what follows. But at least the create the proportion the increase in the proportion of people who join out of revenge and perhaps a community protection is consistent with attacks in the village uh, creating motivations to join militia. So in the next step we separate the household and the house and the village effect. Uh, to look at the household effect, we um, look at the same variable, the effect of collective victimization that disaggregate data at the household level and control for whether the household has previously been attacked. And what you find is that if the village is attacked, that would be kind of the pure community motivation. Uh, first of all, the money motivation goes out because it's, it's independent of whether your assets are destroyed, but it's all driven by revenge and in terms of magnitude, again, not significant, but by the desire to protect the community, these other people who join. Now, when you look at the household level, um, in order to control for whether the village has been attacked, we just include village year fix effect. So this specification compares households who in the same village, no matter what happened in the village, have been attacked to households who in that village have not been attacked. And what you see is that the effect of being attacked is large. It persists with the extra samples. And it's all entirely driven by people who join with a desire to protect uh, the family, consistent with uh, that being the uh, creation of motivations to join arising from exposure uh, to victimization in the household. So that's, as I said, it's only suggestive, but it's consistent with the idea together with the patterns of sorting that one of the forces that explains why people join is the creation of non-pecuniary motivations that arise from attacks on their households or on the community uh, that lead them to join. There's all sorts of robustness checks that we look, we don't have an quasi-exogenous variation in foreign-led armed groups attack, even though we use within household, within village variation. But we use a variety of strategies, including uh, not so credible instrumental variables, but all sorts of selection on observables strategies to assess whether this is a causal relationship. And second, whether there are alternative channels that may explain the formation of these, uh, the decision to join in response to attacks. So perhaps your household assets have been depleted, and that's what leads you to join for economic reasons. We find no evidence of that being a channel. 
uh, or you becoming oversensitive to uh, reporting attacks uh, uh, if you participate, or um, or attacks having a direct effect on occupational trade-offs. In particular, if the respondent is directly the victim of an attack, it is likely that it affects their occupational trade-offs directly. So it's all driven by the family members of the respondent. So that's kind of just the body of suggestive evidence in support of this additional explanation for conflict being potentially non-economic. And I think as, as Francesco points out, probably it's not going to be necessary to have all of these regressions at the beginning because uh, neither do they dismount the economic channel, neither are they relevant for the point I think that we try to make. So, so that's the first point of the paper. But the second point uh, is about um, the decision not necessarily being an individual decision. So what we do in this second part of the paper is we focus on these people who, 13% of people who told us that the reasons they joined it have to do with coercion by villagers, village institutions. And so we look more closely at what uh, villages do in order to uh, mobilize participation, village institutions. And specifically, um, we narrow the analysis on two, the two security vacuums that I initiated the talk uh, that happened in Shabunda, first in 2004 when this, with the sensitive peace agreement, and second uh, in 2011 with the regimentation policy. And so what you see, this is only in Shabunda, that in response to the security vacuum, you see an increase in uh, recruitment campaigns uh, in the village. This increase is in part driven by an increase in campaigns that are initiated by the chief, uh, that are, sorry, public campaigns, but they're not initiated by the chief. What you see the big difference, just as I hinted at the beginning, the Rai Mutomboki really skyrockets in 2011 with this security vacuum induced by the regimentation. And that's exactly when the type of recruitment campaigns that also skyrocket are driven in part by the chief initiated recruitment campaigns, unlike in the previous um, history in DRC. When you look at other places that are not in Shabunda, that are not affected by these security vacuums, you don't really see these effects. Uh, I can show you that these are the Rayamudumbuki that spread out of Shabunda uh, later on, but these are not local phenomena. So we exploit variation over space and over time to look at whether perhaps security the value of security in the village may explain the involvement of village institutions in recruitment into militia that as at the first step. And as if it were another reduce form, this is not going to be an ID. We also look at in Shabunda, the types of people who join. And so you, this is the stock of participants in Shabunda over time. And uh, these uh, dotted and the thinner lines are the inflows of recruits. So for instance, in the year 2000, there's a big spike of voluntary recruitment, another in 2004, 2005. Um, and perhaps uh, the most significant rise in non-voluntary recruitment appears in 2012, um, as well as voluntary recruitment. These coincide, but are not necessarily caused by these um, chief initiated campaigns. Outside of Shabunda, you do not see these effects during the security vacuum. So a natural question to ask is first, can these security vacuums explain the involvement of village institutions to mobilize recruitment? And second, are these, participate, these recruitment campaigns even relevant to explain recruitment and through what mechanisms? So the first uh, kind of naive regression that I'm gonna show you is whether enrollment, not participation, but the decision to enter the inflow into the armed group could be explained, uh, could be associated with the presence of a village recruitment campaign that is chief initiated. So if you were just to look at the association between those two, controlling for the usual fixed effects, then what do you find? You find that the presence of uh, chief initiated campaigns has a very stark association with whether people participate. When you look at the mean of the dependent variable, most of the participation takes place during uh, years in which there is a chief initiated campaign. Um, and the two channels through which the chief initiated campaign uh, appears to be associated with participation is 
through uh, the, those who join motivated to protect the community, and importantly, those who join because they say they are coerced. Now, of course, this is uh, just an OLS, so it could reflect all sorts of relationships. So in the second step, what we do, we're not going to do an IV because, um, as it's obvious, the effect of the security vacuum on participation can work through other channels than the chief initiated campaigns. But I'm going to decompose the effect of the security vacuum on participation by whether a security campaign takes place in the village, uh, chief initiated campaign. Um, and in particular, so we regress enrollment into militia by whether the village I in year T is affected by the regimentation campaign, which we document. This is extremely strongly associated with security vacuum and attacks by the FDLR. And we decompose the effect of this uh, regimentation by whether uh, a village uh, campaign initiated by the chief was taking place, took place that year. So, um, so the very raw regression uh, out of this, so you have these two security vacuums, only the second leads to the uh, initiation of recruitment campaigns by the chiefs. And they appear to channel um, this, oh, sorry, they appear to be associated with a rise in participation that appears to be correlated with motivations across the board. Um, but then we decompose this effect into campaigns or this effect into participation by whether the campaigns take place uh, during the fully saturated regressions that I just showed you. And what you can see is that the security vacuum in Shabunda in the year 2011 is only associated or is mostly associated with an increase in participation in the villages in which the chief initiates a recruitment campaign. This is associated with a number of motivations, but the most notable one, and perhaps the one that is least likely to be um, affected by alternative interpretations, is the one of coercion, because coercion is only created by the involvement of the village institutions. So the, what we get away from this regression is simply that, number one, the uh, mobilization by the village institutions is uh, a response or is associated with security vacuums that are created by this accident of the regimentation policy. And number two, this regimentation policy or this security vacuum leads to more uh, coerced participation only if there is involvement by the chiefs uh, to mobilize a recruitment campaign. Now, of course, um, the decision of the chief to, to initiate a recruitment campaign is endogenous, so the set of observations here and here are going to be different, but it's nonetheless consistent with the idea that the chief initiation of campaigns is not only a response to insecurity, but it also uh, succeeds potentially in channeling the demands for protection, uh, especially through a variety of channels. One of them is coercion. And I focus on coercion because coercion is almost absent from all the other regressions. And this is the only place where you see coercion becoming important is in relation to the security vacuum and the uh, chief initiate, initiated campaigns. So to conclude, um, we find that perhaps economic explanations that omit the social uh, context could be enriched by two additional, uh, additional explanations. Uh, first, the individual non-pecuniary motivations, and second, coercion by village institutions that depart from this uh, individualistic material framework. And in particular, the militias are best described as social organizations. For sure, they, we know qualitatively also that economic motivations play a role, but there's also an other quite important role related to community-oriented social motivations, related to revenge, and the desire to protect the family and the community. Um, it's not a novel idea uh, across social sciences. Um, joining militia constitutes an important life decision for individuals who experience uh, violence in, in war. Um, and, and even though there is, we find evidence even in the self-reported narratives that people join for economic motivations, many do not. Um, and they have these non-pecuniary motivations. It's consistent with, also with a large literature uh, with big L by Congolese ex-combatant accounts and autobiographies, as well as novels across other contexts in civil war that describe the process that lead individuals to take arms as uh, 
being motivated by many other factors than just economics. It's also not a special case of an unrepresentative conflict. Take, for instance, I'm just going to give you an example, one that is perhaps more known today in Mexico. And recently in a documentary, Jose Manuel, Manuel Mireles Valverde, who uh, was one of the leaders of the Autodefensas movement in Michoacán, described that every single of their members of his self-defense militia had lost a relative or a close friend to the drug cartels. And that ex experience, he explained, is the foundation of their commitment. Yet just like in the Congo, the drug cartels may be better explained by economic motivations, but there's this other side of the conflict that's nonetheless quite important. The self-defense militia that then become quite large uh, that hinge on different types of motivations. Or in another documentary in about Pakistan and Afghanistan, you see a tribal letter, leader of, um, of a town in Pakistan saying, yes, the son of the leader, I had lots of friends in the village. I've seen many of them getting amputated because of the bombing. The bodies would be covered in blood. Uh, I will not forget this suffering, even if I live 100 years, we will take our revenge, God willing. And his father explains, like, you see how their mind is full of hatred now. You create terrorists, so they join the Taliban. And so that's just the very same logic across societies. Um, there is, however, an open puzzle in this account, the idea that violence perpetrated by foreign-led or illegitimate organizations might cause violence in the first violence to occur. A very kind of economist question would be, well, why do they perpetrate violence in the first place? Don't they anticipate the backlash? And so part of the explanation may be uh, perhaps the cost of the backlash is worth the perpetration of the initial violence, even though it's socially costly, conflict can occur in, in equilibrium and it may be beneficial for those perpetrating the violence. But another explanation, which I think is a fertile ground for future research, is the psychological and political processes that potentially lead to underestimate the harm caused by violence or the capacity of mobilization by the opponent. So I just wanted to close with suggesting that this is an interesting area of research. Um, and that's, that's basically it. Thanks, Raul. I think, you know, on this last note, I think that the timing consistency is also like the big thing, like current leaders, like they, they know there's going to be backlash, but, you know, they'll probably be gone by the time that materializes or, I mean, it's like a short term calculations that, that neglect those costs, you know, like politicians in anywhere. I don't know, that's what I mean. Yeah, I think so. It's, uh, it's consistent, perhaps with the principal agent framework for explaining conflict where the, the agent does not internalize the cost of the conflict and therefore, which is the politician for, partly because of time inconsistency or because the distribution of the cost. Yeah. All right, I think we are, we are out of time. I can, uh, I have some, some ideas on the Roy stuff, but we can, I can follow up via email if you want. But That'd be really useful, yes. All right, so thank you everyone for, for participating. We, we're kind of running, running out of time already, so I think we have to call it off. And thanks, Raul, for, for joining us. Hope to thanks see you lot. in person. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.